Hello and welcome to Asasaba, a podcast that honors oral tradition and shines light on Ghanaian cultures and stories that are often untold or silenced. I'm your host, Michelle, and my pronouns are she and her. Welcome back, officially season two. It's been almost a year since season one, and I'm really excited to be back. I feel um, better rested and ready, you know, for season two. I know last time when I, I taught, when I ended off season one, I just, I needed that short break, but it turned into a longer break, which, you know, makes sense with the current climate and everything. Um, but yeah, I really needed that. And I feel rejuvenated and revived and ready to be back. Um, and you know, how's everyone doing? I know there's a lot going on. 2020 has been a whirlwind of stuff, of a lot. So we have COVID-19, the global uprisings, protesting against anti-Blackness and oppression, anti-queerness, transphobia. So I really hope that, you know, Everyone feels like they have, you know, a source of community, people to, who can at least like validate and affirm them, you know, and if it doesn't exist um, physically, locally, I feel like, I hope that people have that kind of digital space where, um, you know, they feel like they can be heard and, and seen and affirmed. I've all, always and often um, went to the digital kind of realm of things to feel feel that way, you know, my digital communities. Um, and that comes in the form of like the podcasts I, I listen to and like the independent media that I consume and all of that. So I hope people, you know, have that digital community and, you know, part of the reason for creating this podcast is to develop that digital community um, for Ghanaians. So I hope that you have that and, you know, at least you see this space as a, a place where, you know, you can have that community if you don't have it um, locally or if you want an additional space where you can feel affirmed and validated in your existence yeah so season two first of all I want to say sharing goes a long way if you enjoy Assassin by you like this podcast subscribe so that you can get updates whenever a new episode drops and please share with your friends your family your community tell your friend your brother your sister your auntie your coworker, your cousins to listen and you know share the links on twitter on Instagram, um, Asasaba is now on Instagram, so share there. So you can follow the Twitter page at Asasaba Pod, A S A S E B A Pod, to keep updated on the podcast. Um, you can also follow Asasaba on Instagram, also at Asasaba Pod. Um, and when you listen, you're feeling you're feeling something, you're feeling a gem, you want to share it, hashtag pause so I can see it and so other people can see it as well. Yeah, so again, like, don't keep this podcast to yourself. You're enjoying it. Let other people know. Spread the word. Let's build this community. So another way to support Asasaba is by donating. As the sole creator of Asasaba, I exert um, a lot of labor to make sure this comes to life. I produce, I interview, I edit, um, and I do all the things. <laughs> so if you want to support me as an independent creator, you can uh support via PayPal and the link is in the show notes so check it out there and you know just do this if you're able to I know during corona you know it's impacted a lot of people and stuff so only do this if you're able to and you know the other way to the other way to support is also by sharing and um, amplifying the messages and all that so thank you thank you thank you everyone so season two it's all about the elders and the older adults in the community. 
their stories, their experiences. And I just feel like we need a space, you know, especially in modern society and within our technology spaces, such as podcasting, we need a space for elders as well and older adults, right? It's not only for the youth. We need to amplify the voices and experiences and the stories of the older folks in our community. Um, and just doing this season, which focuses on elders, you know, um, I just also wanted to show the complexity and nuance and humanity of their own unique experiences and bring their voices to the forefront. And also as a youth myself, like just conducting the interviews, I've learned a lot from the elders and I hope you are able to learn something as well. And it's not just, I'm not just giving them the mic or whatever, just so that they can, um, I mean, they're a great source of wisdom, but also just so to keep their stories preserved and their stories heard and stuff like that, you know, and to show, as I said, like their nuance and their the humanity and their own unique experiences so they too can be affirmed and validated by telling their stories and stuff. So I really hope you enjoy this. Uh, so, all right, so let's launch into the episode. And um, so I interview Auntie Felicia. She talks about growing up in Ghana during independence and also just her family's journey from Togo to the Volta region to Kumase and her involvement with the young pioneers, herbalism, really, really cool discussion there, immigrating to Canada in 1970, the associations, Ghanaian associations she's been a part of, intelligentials within, within those groups, connecting with the Ewa community, her work as a hairstylist and salon owner, how she practices self-care, racism in the church, taking care and helping seniors during COVID-19, wisdom for the youth, and much, much more. And, you know, it was really great talking to an elder uh, with her experiences. She's 74. Um, so it was really great hearing her her life experiences and her stories and, and all that. And you guys will definitely enjoy this episode. So stay tuned and here we go. See you after. <laughs> so Auntie Felicia, thank you so much for uh, joining me today. Can you please okay. introduce yourself? My name is uh, Mrs. Felicia Boutry. Actually, it's Opon Boutry because my husband's actual last name is Opon. His family name is Opon. Mm -hmm. But he kind of dropped it as he was uh, growing up. So uh, the name is Felicia. I'm known in Toronto here as Felicia, Mrs. Felicia Boutry. Okay, perfect. If you want to share your age or and like what you're really passionate about, uh, you can add that in as well. Okay. Uh, just June, the past June the second this month, at ten seventy four. Yes, and, and happy uh, birthday again, Auntie. <laughs> thank you very much. Okay, that's great. Um, so, where were you born and raised, Auntie? I was born and bred in Kumasi, uh, Fantinu Town in Kumasi, Ghana. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, I grew up there. And it was fun growing up. I, I have a, uh, we are from a family of 10, nine siblings, my, my mother's side. And then um, um, I think about, let me see, about seven or eight from, you know, my father's uh, second wife and uh, previous uh, child he had so we were all about maybe 14. Wow so that's a really yeah. big family so you were never bored then? <laughs> no never bored never <laughs> bored 14 I'm saying 14 my maths uh, pardon my maths it's a little bit more than that because uh, we are about we were about I'll say 17 or 17 17 to be exact 
Wow. Yeah, that's certainly yes. a big, big family. Um, yes. So on to pre-interview, you mentioned that uh, your family is Ewe. How, yes. how did your family end up in Kumase? Well, my parents migrated to Kumasi. Mm-hmm. My uh, parents are actually, they were cousins. So it was difficult for us growing up knowing that my mom and dad are from the same family. You know, so when people ask, where's your father from, where's your mother from? I said, well, they are the, the same family. They were cousins. So they more or less come from the same place. And uh, uh, I know we are from the royal family of Anyako, uh, which is uh, Aba. Yeah, it's called Aba Daku family of Anyako. That is where my my great grandfathers originally migrated from to Togo during the during the uh, their fishing trips. So I uh, I had my great grandfather or my great great grandfather settle in a village in Kita and uh, in Togo, and that's where my parents were born. Uh, but they used to travel and told her the story of where they were original from, which is Kita in Volta region and also Anyako. So those places were where they migrated from to go to Togo. And then my parents migrated to Kumasi. Okay, I see. Uh, so from Togo and then to uh, the Volta region and then to Kumasi. Yes. Okay. And um, growing up in Kumase, um, how was your experience like in terms of like um, just, you know, around you, um, the environment? What kind of things did you enjoy doing as a child? Well, uh, mostly, you know, we as the immigrant parents, and then they, they have to struggle to survive. So. My mom used to sell stuff. So we used to help her, you know, in her selling. So after school, you help your mom. She had a store at the Asafo Market. So after school, you go there and help. And, you know, I mean, normal growing up in, 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 in Ghana, you, 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 go to, you go to church, you, you join your friends, I wasn't very, very, very much because of my father was a very strict father. So I wasn't very, I, I, I didn't have a big, big, huge social life. Like from school, your home, you're doing your homework, you go out, you play with the neighborhood kids, and that's it. Okay. So we were, not, we were not used to, especially the girls in the family, we're not used to having the opportunity to go to parties and dances and stuff like that. My father would say it's very immoral. So he, he didn't allow us to be involved in those things. Oh, okay. And how did you feel about that? Did you feel like you were missing out on anything or how did you feel? Well, yes, when we were young, you know, you see your friends going to these things, you also want to do it. But then it depends on the family you are growing up in. I had a uh, uh, my mother's side, I had six brothers, and they were very, very strict with me. And any time, yeah, they see even boys talking to you, it was a big problem. It oh. was a big problem. So I didn't. We, we joined the young pioneers. That's the, when the young pioneers came out. We joined the young pioneers. You know, he allowed us to do a bit, but not not very much. Okay, and auntie. Can you explain what uh, the Young Pioneers is for those who don't know? The Young Pioneer was uh, like uh, uh, when Kwame Nkrumah was in power, he believed in communism. So he tried to bring communism ideas to Ghana at that time. So he formed the Young Pioneers with uh, communism ideology where the young ones who grew up and uh, we were like young soldiers that, you know, when there's any event in Ghana, the young pioneers will march, will do things that will glorify Nkumaism. Okay. And what age were you when you joined? 
I was, uh, I don't even know, I was around maybe 14, 13, 14, 15. Oh, around okay. there. And um, Auntie, so that was around uh, 50s, 60s, in the 60s? Um, in the 60s. Okay. So, yes. you know, Kwame uh, Nkrumah came into power leadership um, 1957, right? That's when Ghana got its independence. Uh, so you must have seen such a huge change, right, with that transition. What was your experience like witnessing uh, Ghana change so much and become an independent nation? You mean from then and now? No, like from uh, before 1957 and then after 1957. Well, uh, before 1957, the country was really being ruled by uh, white men. Mm -hmm. the Brit it, we were in the British colony. Yep. And uh, and then after independence, Nkrumah tried to uphold to what the British left behind and also building a lot of factories. We had the canning, canning factories, the jute factories, and all kind of factories. So it wasn't hard for people to get job to do. So the young people weren't traveling abroad and traveling all over Africa to find work or for greener pastures because they were they they had work to do. But after Nkrumah was overthrown, then the leaders who came couldn't uphold to what Nkrumah did. So most of the factories were closed down. And economically, it became very hard. So from there on, things started to get harder in Ghana, I think. Did your family and yourself, did you feel the hardships, like, of the economy going down and with, you know, all the oh, coup yeah. happening? Like, how did it affect you and your family? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. I did. Okay. Yeah, it must have been a very difficult time then. Yeah, it was. It was a change for so many people. So many politicians had to run away from Ghana because of, you know, the new leaders that came. And then, you know, African politics is not straightforward like here. So if you if you are in another regime, the, the new regime may not like your, your, your ideas, you know, and they, some people have to be killed, some run away. So there were a lot of turmoil. Yeah, that's that's really difficult. Um, yeah. And, you know, I actually wanted to circle back because um, pre-interview, we had a conversation on the phone and then you mentioned that uh, you grew up in a family where your grandfather was a chief and then, you know, he passed on a lot of his knowledge down to your mom and then to you in terms of, in terms of like herbalism and stuff like that. Yeah, and, you know, yeah, right. My yeah, and, and I was going to say just like, you know, right now um, we're going through like even Corona and all of that kind of stuff. What are some things that you learned from your family in regards to herbalism? Okay, my, my grandfather was a chief and also a herbalist. Mm -hmm. And uh, as I was growing up, I was young, maybe around five, six, seven, my mother would take me to the village. And I used to see him heal a lot of people with herbs all kinds of herbs and, I, and one herb that I remember very well that he was using a lot of was garlic and aloe vera. I saw him using a lot of that when I even at that young age. So uh, my mother also picked some as we were growing. She would boil a whole lot of uh, herbs in a pot. She had about six pots and every morning before we go to school we have to drink a cup each from these uh, 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 pots. So it kept us. She had 10 of us, but none of us ever had any serious diseases or ever end up in a hospital with any sickness or disease. And uh, sometimes I would see her, she used the neem tree and the neem leaves a lot. Mm -hmm. When somebody got, had, get a fever, she would pick the neem trees, boil it, and make you drink some. She would bathe you with some and also make you cover your head and inhale the vapor, you know. So 
I saw her using a whole lot of herbs. When somebody has eye style or something like that, she will send you to go and pick this this leaf that has some milky stuff in it. Go and pick it and bring it, and she will break it and put it on the eyeball. So she did a whole lot of all these. You know, she was using a whole lot of herbs when we were growing up. So uh, I know that it helped us a lot. And with this COVID, although we have lost this, Africans don't really write anything down. It's passed on by only what you see. If if they had written a book about all the herbs they were using, it would be good. We won't be in this, you know, uh, problem that we are in now because we've lost all that good uh, uh, treatments. So we depend mostly on uh, uh, the medication that a white man is uh, given us. And um, with this pandemic, I saw a lot of it on uh, YouTube. People giving a whole lot of uh, recipes for, but in most of the recipes, I still see most of the ingredients that my mother used to use, like cloves, ginger, garlic, uh, 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 not so much, of, uh, yeah, ginger, cloves, garlic, and all the other spices that, you know, are used today. Mm -hmm. I, I saw my mother using them. So most of them are in some of the recipes that are being shown on YouTube. Myself, during this pandemic, I boil sorrel, which is hibiscus, uh, hibiscus flowers, uh, dry hibiscus flowers with pineapple, garlic, cloves, and some other spices that I, I don't even know the, the name. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but I remember that when I see them, I know my mom used to use them. Yeah. So I'll boil them all together and, and be drinking it. I give it to my, my family too. I ask them to drink it. That's good. That's nice. And yeah. the fact that you said, um, you know, we need to find a way to just record all of this knowledge and, and wisdom and stuff. Auntie, yeah. like you still, you, you're still recalling a, a lot of the things that your family did. Maybe, you know, you can write something down and pass it on, you know? You see, it's true. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. But the thing is, you see, when you are watching uh -huh. them pick up this, all these uh, herbs, you don't really see how the preparation is. Okay. All you know is you see them prepare it. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they boil it. Sometimes they, 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 they ground it. Some, uh, sometimes they make it into an uh, like a ashy paste. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes they even uh, dry it on in a pot on a stove, and it becomes like a a powdery, a black powdery. Uh, 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 what do I put it? It, it looks like a powder. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's smooth, and then they use that also for rashes and for all sort of uh, sicknesses. But as I'm saying. We didn't pay that much attention because, I mean, you know, it's your parents doing something. And usually if a parent will sit you down and say, I want you to learn this, then you learn it. Otherwise, you know, as you were growing up as children, you, you sometimes even your parents doing something and you want to know what it is, they'll tell you, free hawk, you are too nosy. <laughs> <laughs> Help us them to do free or call. Yeah. So with that, you know, even when you see them doing something, you watch it with your eyes, but most times you can't ask any question. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. But I wish I, I wish I had known all those and know the recipes and how it's done. It would be so great. I, I would write a big book about it. Yeah. But right. what I know is, yeah, what I know is the herbs her, her, her work. God created with, with all that herbs. Most of the uh, the trees and flowers around us are uh, God's way or God's prescription for us. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, to use. But because we've lost history, nothing was written down, we won't be able to recapture all those memories, good, good uh, 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 recipes that we were, we were left by uh, our, our forefathers used to use. 
Yeah, and I guess like we, I guess we can do what we can with that because even with this podcast that I'm doing, one of my goals is just to um, honor that kind of oral tradition that we have as a culture by yes. interviewing different people and getting their stories and getting them to talk about their experiences. So yes. I guess we can do it in the way that um, we kind of know how to, which is oral tradition. I know there are some cracks and some some things may be lost, but, you know, mm-hmm. we do what we can, right? Yeah, right yeah. now in Ghana, in the in the in the nineties, mm-hmm. in the two thousands, I see a whole lot of uh, herbalists, you know, uh, 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 doing all kinds of medi- medicines in Ghana. You know, like herbal this, herbal that. They even have a herbal uh, uh, college where the, the people go and learn how to use herbs. So I I think it's still alive, but I I don't know. Uh, to what degree or how good it is mm-hmm. because um, you have a lot of medications on the market herbal medications on the market in Ghana people are using them but yes so uh, I, 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 we can't really verify how good they are because people are still dying a lot in, in Ghana from all kinds of diseases so I don't know if it's the health that is helping them or it's not. Mm-hmm. Sometimes you hear stories of somebody using herbs and die, you know. But yes, so, uh, it may be good, but it's just like here with the white man's medication that we're using. Sometimes people develop uh, uh, allergy reactions. So it comes with a whole lot of instructions that don't use this if you are this, don't use that if you are that, or if you're using this, don't use that. But I guess that is what we are lacking in Africa. We don't have all those instructions. So it may be good. Some herbs may be good, but it's not uh, It's not good for everybody because of allergy reactions by individuals. Yeah, so people, I guess people got to definitely know how things interact, how different herbs yeah. interact with each other and not just exactly. use it all willy-nilly. They have to have the knowledge. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Okay, yeah, gotcha on that. And um, I guess let's let's go return back to, um, you know, after all the coup and the economic hardships that was going on in Ghana. Um, yes. So, like, you know, what were you doing, like, as a teenager? How was life like? You know, how was, how were you, um, I guess, coping with everything and, and all of that stuff? Well, as you grown up as a teenager, you know your parents are looking after you, so whatever is available, that's what you have. Mm-hmm. You can't do much about it. But then, you know, after you grow up and you're on your own, then that is when you really, you know, take care of yourself and economically, you start to think of, you know, what I should do and what I shouldn't do. Yeah. And what kind of things did you like doing um, as a young adult teenager living in Ghana? My, uh, well, as I said, I live with my parents, so I was spoiled. <laughs> the elders of my, my, in the elders of my uh, mother's uh, daughters, she had uh, uh, four sons and then me. Mm-hmm. So I was pretty much very spoiled. I just live with my parents and enjoy whatever I had to enjoy at that time. Until I got married. Okay. Did you get married yeah. in, in Ghana? Yeah. Oh, I okay. worked a bit. I worked a bit here and there, but you know, uh, I, 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 I just start from where I got married. Okay. And uh, yeah, I got married and uh, we went, we went to Liberia mm-hmm. and I, um, I taught there in Liberia for a while. And then uh, we came back to Ghana. I got pregnant there. I came back to Ghana to have a, a son. And then three months later, we left for Canada. What made you decide to leave for Canada? Well, it's the man's decision, my husband's decision. He wanted to travel abroad mm-hmm. from Africa. So he actually uh, wanted to be in the U.S., but then, according to him, he was in transit here to visit some friends. 
before going to the U.S. And then when he got here, it's not today that they're throwing us out. At that time, when he got here, they, they asked him. Uh, he said, yeah, I'll be in transit for about a couple of weeks and I go to the U.S. So they asked him, uh, what does he do? He said, I'm a businessman. He said, do you have any money on you? He said, yes. So they said, okay, what we will do is we will give you a, a work permit. Stay here for three months. If you don't like it, you can go to the U.S. And then he said the uh, uh, immigration officer, they told him, just watch Channel 7 every night. Every day, watch Channel 7. That is the U.S. channel. And then, and then you see if you still want to go there. But if you don't, you can stay here in Canada. Wow. So, Back in the day when they were begging people to stay here, right? Eh? That's for sure. <laughs> hey, it's okay. Yeah, that's for sure. So, <laughs> so three months later, I came. I joined him uh, three months later. So I came here in December. Actually, I got here on the 24th of December, 1970. Wow. So when yeah. you came here into Canada, what were your thoughts? Oh, well, it was cold. <laughs> I, I, I was difficult because when I was coming, my husband sent us, uh, me and at uh, that time, my, my son, uh, he is now a big man. He was born in 1970. He was just a baby. And then my husband, was deal, he dealt with a travel agency to send us a ticket. And afterwards, he sent a winter coats with the travel agency to send to us. Mm -hmm. But then by the day of us leaving, the winter coat didn't arrive. So we boarded the plane without winter coats. Hey. But it wasn't bad coming from Ghana. But then when we were on, on, on the Atlantic Ocean, oh boy, it was very, very cold. So I was wearing my Ebenezer slits and top, and then, uh, uh, you know, the, the cover. Mm -hmm. So what happened was we were, uh, we were so cold. We came with Panama at that time. So we were given a, a blanket to cover my son. So I covered my son with the blanket myself. Inside the plane wasn't so bad. So we got off. When we, when we were landing at... Uh, uh, JFK, the, um, there was a turbulence, so we couldn't land on time. And uh, by the time we landed in U.S., New York, our connection to Canada had already left. So we were at the airport, and uh, those days we didn't have cell phones to, to just make a quick call. You have to go to the, the, the payphone. So I called my husband and told him we, we missed the flight. Well, we were at the airport and we were told that we had to sleep at the airport till the next morning. Oh, no. And I, yeah, and I refused. I said, no way. Even in Africa, when I travel somewhere by air and then if there's any problem, they give us a hotel. So why should I sleep at the airport? So eventually we were given a hotel. So I went down to the hotel. We were driven to the hotel for the night. The next day, they forgot we were at the hotel. So when it was around 12 o'clock, I went to the receptionist and said, why are we still here? They said the flight will be in the morning, 10 o'clock, but we are still here. She said, oh, they might have forgotten about you here. So the receptionist called the airport, and uh, somebody came for us later. So we boarded a flight from... New York around four o'clock wow. to come to Canada. Yeah, to come to Canada. So when I go to the immigration, they ask me, "Why are you here?" I said, "I'm here to visit my husband or to stay with my husband." They said, "Why didn't you wait until he got his papers?" I said, "No, I can't wait that long. I missed him." They said, "Okay, what is his name?" So they paged him, and he came for us to the home. Aww. Yeah, that was how good it was at that time. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so much has changed since then. Yeah, wow. Very, very much. Very, yeah. very much. So we came we came as our, our, our business people, not as refugees. That time, my husband was passing on to go to the U.S. They begged him to stay in Canada. Yeah. 
<laughs> but if it's today, they will tell you to go on and go to where you want to go. Mm -hmm. But those days were good. Yeah. And yeah. Um, just in terms of like 1970, like were there even any Ghanaians in Canada at that point? There were a few. A few? There were a few Ghanaians, but mostly they were students. Mm -hmm. They were students at U of T and other universities around, so... Sometimes when you, you you want to meet a Ghanaian, we go we had we had one place that we used to shop. It's still the Jewish market, and Spadina. Mm -hmm. So when you go to Jewish market, then all of a sudden you hear somebody speaking a Ghanaian language, any other Ghanaian language. You say hello, hello, hi, I am also a Ghanaian. <laughs> and then <laughs> that is how we met. Uh, yeah, most of uh, most of us, that's how we met each other. Then. So we that weekend. You will meet again at one person's house and, you know, just have fun. Oh, yeah, that's just nice. cook some Ghanaian food and, and have fun and happy because we are meeting uh, each other. Okay. So, yes. Auntie, so um, how did you, you know, connect with, uh, like, specifically the Ewe community in Ghana? I mean, in no, Canada. No, no. You mean in Ghana or in, in Canada? Canada? Sorry, in Canada. Yeah, well, in Ghana, no, no. My parents, that was my parents' job. Yeah. We just watched them as they do their, their traditional stuff. We never, we never, never got involved because we were born in Kumasi. We were more or less Ashantis. I was more involved in the Ashanti culture than the, than the, my ever culture. Even if it wasn't my mother who was fit, we wouldn't be able to speak the language at all because we were more Ashantis than being Ewes. Mm. Yeah, yeah. That was when I was growing up in Ghana. But when I came here, mm -hmm. uh, later on, I wasn't really. We just had an association. We didn't have per se a way association or a shanty association. Or it was later that we started to, in the eighties, that it started to break into all these tribal associations. But when we came in the seventies, we had only one. Ghana Union. That's all we had. Ghana Association. That we we're trying to get all Ghanaians to come together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the first association was started in 1973. When we lost one young man, his name was Bwedu. He was traveling. He got admission at a, a university, I think, in London. University in London, Ontario. Mm -hmm. As he was traveling there, he was involved in an accident and died. Mm -hmm. So that is when we decided that we have to come together because here we are, Ghanaians, we never lost anybody and all of a sudden we have a body at hand we have to take care of. So we came together and contributed what we can and uh, uh, approached the Ghana consulate in, in, in Ottawa. And two or three weeks later, they were able to help us with some money. And they sent the body back home to the family. Oh, so okay. that was, yeah, that was our first association. It was called Ghanaian Benevolent Society. I, I was the uh, financial secretary at that time for the association. So we went on and on, but as typical Ghanaians, uh, you know, it was difficult coming together at that time. So we tried for a while, but it just died down. What made it difficult to come together? What happened? Why did it die well, down? Uh, well, you know, our people, some thought they were more educated than others. And then, you know, few of them had they didn't have much education. So when we go to meetings, like they're trying to express themselves, somebody will start laughing and say, well, your English is bad and this and that. So, you know, it became difficult. Then they'll be, argue, they'll be fighting, arguing and all that because they are being put down by those who think they, they are intelligentia, as we call them. They, they have more education. Mm -hmm. So that is what really caused a lot of trouble at that time. Oh, I see. Yeah, that's, yeah, so, that's not nice. Like you go and you feel like you're, you're going to be um, amongst your people and then people are putting you down. Exactly. That, that doesn't so, sound good at all. Yeah, we we're trying to tell them English is not our language. You look at the, that, that time, we had the Greeks, the Italians, and the Chinese. We see them in politics. Some of them can hardly express themselves, but they are representing their people. 
And it's not their language. So everybody knows that the lot of English that they have, they use it. But our people, for some reason, they think they have been, they are lawyers and doctors and whatever. So they don't have to respect the person who is not. And it became a problem. It yeah. became a big problem at that time. So that is how those who couldn't express themselves well stopped coming to the meetings. And then, you know, it just dwindled away as, as time goes on. Yeah. And um, while you were in Canada, like, was there any kind of um, field or um, what kind of things did you and the family do to sustain yourself while you were here? Well, um, when I came, when I came, my husband was a jeweler. I'm using was because he he passed away four years ago, mm-hmm. but he was a jeweler, mm-hmm. and uh, you know what do you call goldsmith by in the Ghana standard, they say goldsmith. Yeah, so he was a jeweler, and uh, he was working with uh, he worked with few companies before he opened up his own business. And myself, I, uh, when I came, I had uh, the son, my son, and then I had a daughter immediately as I came, you know, and uh, I, got a pre- I got pregnant and then had a daughter. And uh, also later on, my husband believed that as the kids were young, there's no point that I go to work. So I stayed home a bit, mm-hmm. and then later on I had twin boys. But before the twin boys, I went back to college. I went to Centennial College, and I took a <clears throat> medical and uh, commercial secretarial course. Mm-hmm. And I worked with um, I worked with this college. After I finished Centennial College, I was hired there, so I worked as an uh, uh, enrollment clerk with the college. And also afterwards, I work with um, I work with uh, another company before I got pregnant with the twins. Okay, and and yeah, how was your experience while you were, um, I guess, working with those companies? What was your experience like? Because back then, was that what time period was that? Was that still in the seventies, or was that later on? Uh, well, um, everywhere at that time, discrimination was there. But once you are hired by a company, you know that you know they 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 don't have that kind of you know intolerance, so they will hire you. And I, I work with uh, Centennial College. It was good. There was no dis- there was you know that systematic uh, discrimination was there, but it's not the the person or the the boss or the manager who hired you who is discrimination against you, sometimes it's some of the staff members. Mm-hmm. And that, you know, if you know you're right, you can always, you know, uh, uh, argue with them. And also, if you're doing what you're doing, you're doing it well, they have nothing against you. They can't stop you. As you say, if you're black, anything you're doing with in a white environment, you have to do it two or three times better you know, so that nobody will put you down or try to fire you for what you are doing. So I work with Scepter Manufacturing as an edit clerk. I was editing all the invoices before it's sent out. So I worked there for a while, but then after that's after I had the twins. Mm-hmm. I still wanted to work, but then uh, it was difficult for my husband because he, he, he didn't want me to work, period. So anytime I tried to work, it will start fighting that I stop because most of the money is going to babysitting because by then I had four kids, my, my, my son, my daughter, and the twins. So he thought most of the money is going to babysitters. Okay. So, yeah, so while I, whilst I was with Scepter, he decided that we'll be moving back to Africa. So I should learn something that when I go to Africa, I can open my own business. So I look around and I say, what else? By then there was a lady who was selling a beauty salon. So he said, okay, why don't you go and learn the 
you know, uh, the hair business so that I can buy you this salon before we go back to Africa. So I thought about it and I said, well, it meant well. So I resigned from my company and then I went to uh, hairdressing school. So I started with uh, one in Scarborough called Topaz and then I ended up at Bruno's where I finished. When I finished, I uh, worked with few salons. Then I started teaching at Topaz. I started teaching at Topaz. I taught there for a while and then opened up my own business. Ah, uh, that's and cool. I, so you opened yeah, up your own hair salon after? Yes. Okay. I opened up my own salon in, uh, uh, what is it? Is it 99, 89, 89, around 89, 89, 2000, I opened up my own business. And uh, it was in Scarborough. So uh, while I was working in my own business, because of what I do, and I do it well, I continue on to study. I went to Dudley, I went to several uh, 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 schools in the U.S. to better myself because I know that when I go to Ghana, I wanted to open up a school, a uh, cosmetology school. So I studied very well. Continue on to go to Dudley's University, and after that, when I came back, I was also nominated to work on the movies in Toronto. So I was doing hair on movies. Oh, a lot, that's dope. yeah, mm -hmm. a lot of movies in Toronto, and I also nominated, hired to teach cosmetology again at Marvel School of Hair Design. So I was working on movies. I had my salon, and I was also teaching. And uh, then the competition came in our com uh, in uh, 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 in Toronto for the black hair stylist competition. So I entered that. And then in 1994, I won the hairstylist of the year. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah. So I kept on with it until I retired. But uh, we, we were going to move to Ghana, but then because of circumstances that came, we couldn't go back. I couldn't go back. My husband went and came back again. But because of disappointments and, you know, family not helping with what we wanted to do, you know, money being, uh, you know, wasted by family and all that, we end up, uh, you know, staying back. How did you feel about your plans being changed? Why did that plan change? No, like, how did you feel? Were you disappointed that you couldn't go to Ghana and, and do what you wanted to do? Or how did you feel when, when the plans well, changed? Well, we lost a lot because uh, when our our goods arrive in Ghana, all our belongings and everything, uh, two weeks before the, sh the, the ship landed, that was when Rollins had the coup. Mm -hmm. Because my husband had a contract with the, the Lehman's government to go and open up a, a jewelry factory in Ghana. So all that contract was signed by the Lehman government, but then the new government refused to fulfill it, which is the Rollins government refused to fulfill it. So, I mean, more or less, all our plans went down the drain, mm -hmm. and everything that we sent there was is a mismanaged by family members. So mm. that's why we had to start all over again. Okay. It and was a big disappointment by then. Okay. And, um, you know, just continuing on with like, um, staying in Canada and all of that stuff. Um, you said that you were, so you used to be part of that um, association and that kind of fell off. Did you, yeah. did any uh, new associations come up and were you part of it? And how were you connecting with the community? 
with the we mean with the Ghanaian community. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, it, it, it was funny. Then all of a sudden, you see another group will start to form it again, and then it will go down. It kept on going on until the eighties when the tribes decided then Ashanti Association was formed. And it's still it's still here. The Ashanti Association is still strong in here. We started the Ashanti Association. We help in every way that we can. I I am one of the people who have trained the children to do the traditional dance, the Adwa dance at that time. Mm -hmm. And uh, I help with the uh, you know the inaugurations and everything. The first hairband and uh, Afena and all that that the king the chief. The first chief used, I crafted them all. Wow. They, yeah, they didn't bring anything from Ghana. I crafted the headband, the the, the sword, and everything that the, the, the first chief used in Toronto here. I was a member of the association also for a while. That's really cool that you are like uh, just this, such a, you know, pivotal member of uh, the group and, you know, starting doing things from scratch. That's really cool. Um, yes. And you said um, there were other, like, groups forming, different ethnic groups. Were you able to, like, connect? I know you said you were very much immersed in the um, Asante culture. Also, but yeah. with, like, the Ewa culture, were you able to connect with um, other people through an, an, an yes. Ewa so association? Yes. Later on, the ladies... Um... When my, my, I think it was my mother passed away and I was going home. And I had, I, I, had, I had a friend, she passed away now, her name is Charity. She saw me off at the airport and I said, you know, Charity, it's good when I come back, let's, uh, when I'm gone, try to gather some women so that when I come back, we can form a women's association, women's group that will be there for each other in time of needs like this. So... When I came back, she had gathered mostly, she was also an Ewe woman. She gathered a, a few Ewe women. So we formed, a, uh, we formed a, an, an organization called the Ewe Women's Association of Toronto. Mm -hmm. And I also I was the leader. And we did few conferences. We, 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 we visited few uh uh, events and stuff like that and that also we went on for a while but then I became so busy in my work you know working on the movies looking after my salon and teaching it was just too much for me to be involved in any organization again so I kind of you know pulled myself from uh, a lot of uh, the activities the, including the Ashanti organization and every other organization, I pull myself a bit off that. Okay. And um, quickly, Auntie, what's a movie that you worked on? It's so many. <laughs> it's so many. What's it's one so movie many. that you can uh, list? One movie. I'm sure people will be curious. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, one movie that you will see my hairstyles. Oh, it's... Uh, how to lose a guy in 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 ten days? Oh wow! That's, there are most of the styles on the I did. Wow, that's amazing. Yes, yes. and uh, I work on so many American prints, uh, so many so many movies. I I have to take my list to. I work over I work over two three hundred movies, you know, and I work for private companies, production companies where I key, I key their movies, I key a movie. Uh, uh, call. Oh, I forgot so many of them. I, if I had known, I would have pulled my files out to uh, to give you some of the movies that I keyed in Toronto. Wow, but, that's uh, really cool, though, Auntie. <laughs> yes, <laughs> sure. Yes. You have a long, long list. Yes, but then later on, I started to have a lot of because I I thought I think it's because I was doing too much. I started to burn out. Yeah. So I started to have a lot of pains in my body. It was just so much that I couldn't handle anything again. So I sold my salon and I was teaching and working on the movies. But later on, the last movie I did was 50 Cent. 
how to get rich, I think. Yeah. Oh, with, with the rapper 50 Cent? Yes. Oh. Yes. yes. Okay. I, just, wow. I think it's how to get rich and Yeah, and how to get yeah, how to get rich or die trying. I think that's die the name. Yeah. Right. Okay, exactly. I got to watch it now and see. Forgive me, my memory is not as sharp as it used to be. So, forgive me. Uh yes, that was the last movie I did. I was in so much pain. I was just, you know, carrying off carried off the set. So, Aww. yeah. I, I was the president of the Hairdressers Association of Ontario, mm-hmm. the Black Hairdressers Association of Ontario. I was also the vice president. Wow. So doing all of that stuff. Yeah, I can yes. imagine, it. Yes. you know, the impact on your body and even your um, yes. emotional well-being, just being so busy all the time. Um, right. So how did you take care of yourself after you reach that point of burning out? Well, that time um, I was go- started going to church. Mm-hmm. Uh, and around, the, around 90, 93, 94, I started going to church. I, I was going to church before, but not a, a, a Ghanaian church. I was going to church in my neighborhood. I mean, I was going to, I went to Baptist church, but there was few things that few racism even at the church at that time. I remember we would go to church and sometimes they're having uh, events. We will go down with my children and even the, uh, the the pastor himself will not sit next to us. He walk walk right past us and sit with all the other white congregation. So. You know, it was difficult going to church at that time. But then, because I wanted my children to know about Christ, we were going. Yeah. And then later on, I met my uh, brother-in-law, Pastor Donko of All Nations. Yes, we met him because uh, when he came to Canada, he was looking for us. But for for some reason, we never met until around uh, 93. So we started going to church, and uh, that's when I I stopped most of the association stuff and got involved in church more, which I'm still involved in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, what other kinds of things, like even right now, what other kinds of things do you do to take care of yourself and ensure that you know, you're well physically and also emotionally? Well, um, it's, 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 uh, I, 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 I'm relaxed more because my children are grown and uh, it's not like when they were young, they are grown, I'm relaxed more. And uh, also I'm involved in the church. I, I am, uh, as soon as I went to church, I got involved in the hostess ministry. I was in the hostess ministry. I've been in, I, I'm still in the hostess ministry since I went to church. And then I am uh, also the leader of the prayer group. We have a prayer line that people call in on, on Tuesdays. Our pastor preaches on uh, television and people phone in for prayers. So I'm the leader for that group. And also uh, we have a seniors group at church. And also I'm the leader for the seniors group. And I'm also a cell leader. So I, I, it, once you are always involved, you can never stop being involved. Right. Yeah. You, all, you always want to help because I, I am a community person and I love to help my fellow human beings. Yeah. So, yeah. So I'm still helping. And right now, uh, we have the Ghana Union that I just started about a couple of years now. And I'm involved, and it's going on by God's grace. It's better than ever. So we have the youth group. We have the seniors group. We have the general group. We have children's homework group. And it's it's just fantastic the way it's going. So I'm involved. And right now, during the COVID, I make sure that our seniors in the community, our our president, uh, through him, to Ghana Union, we got in touch with uh, uh, United Way, 
and first harvest. And he provide cook meals for organizations who want to help their people. Mm-hmm. So we got involved in that. So every Friday, we get about 200, 250 cook meals. And I make sure that I have people in our community, Ghanaians, the seniors and the, the needy are served every Friday. So That's serve, really good. Yeah, we get volunteers. The youth are fantastic. The youth group, they are fantastic. And we got youth volunteer drivers. And some pastors actually in the community also are help with the driving. So every Friday, I get about seven, eight, nine drivers. And they take the food and they go all over with the list that I have. And they deliver food to all the seniors and the needy every Friday. Actually, really, today, mm-hmm. yeah, today, they are uh, the one one of the youth ladies has a birthday, and she decided since there's COVID and she can't have a party, the money that she will use for the party, her name is Obaya, the name that she, the money that she will use for the party, to use it to cook for the seniors. So actually, as I'm sitting here, we have about eight drivers out there delivering wachi and kinky to the seniors and the, need, and the needy in the community. Wow, that's amazing. And like, yes. you know, even with everything that's going on in the world right now with like the um, anti-Black racism in the U.S. and in Canada as well, like I've just been yes. thinking a lot about community and how important that is, how, you know, it's important to just be there for each other and just nourish yes. our communities and nourish ourselves as well. And so it's so great to hear that, you know, the Ghanaian community in Toronto is like doing that as well. That's really yes, good. Yes, yes, this is the first time we are actually, you know, reaching out to each other as a group. And I mean, we are strong because if anything happened to anybody in the community right now, I am so impressed. We rally around and then we help. And I have never been excited in my life than now with the Ghanaians in Canada. I Toronto per se, because we got a dynamic team with the president being strong and then the team being supportive, we are getting somewhere. Yeah. We are getting somewhere. So we are uh, uh, we are praying that soon we'll be able to build our heritage center where Ghanaians, seniors, everyone and the kids can go and sit and, and, and practice their culture and everything. Yeah, that would be really, really amazing to see. And just speaking of like, you know, practicing the culture and everything, um, yes. just, you know, being part of all these associations and just your experiences and your um, role as an elder today, what are some cultural traditions or customs that you'd like to impart onto the future generation? Well, I, last time the youth had a concert, a, a virtual concert because of this COVID. Actually, we are happy because they were able to raise $2,000 from that and, and, and give all the money to help with the seniors course. Mm-hmm. And uh, well, I, 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 I spoke with them. I said it was beautiful what they did, but I would like to see more culture because I, 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 that is one of our aims now as seniors. We have to try as much as we can to impart most of the culture to our kids. Because now, when we came here in the 70s, uh, I believe it was hard even trying to let your children speak the language. Because I remember my son was only about four or five. And uh, he was in school, I think, junior kindergarten or grade one. And uh, he was a quiet boy. So the teachers will call me to school and say, ask me, why is your child so quiet? Because sometimes he will speak a certain language and say brah to his friends or something like that. So are you speaking your language to him at home? I said, yes. They said, no, 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 you have to stop speaking your language. It will confuse him because now he's learning everything here. And then if he has to learn your language and also, and I said, we grew up learning about four. We grew up just learning four or five languages just growing up in the neighborhood. 
and it didn't confuse us in any way learning the English language. So why would that affect our children? But then they insisted. And then, you know, being in a new country and don't know anything, we decided, okay, and we we're just, you know, speak English to him at home so that would make it easier for him at school. But oh boy, were we ever wrong? You know, so we should have stick to that. So I find out that most Ghanaians are also doing that today. They speak English to their children. Even when I went home, I was so sure to learn that all the young kids growing up in Ghana, as little as a year, two years, their parents are speaking English to them. They don't speak their language anymore. And I was so mad and upset and begging them not to do that because they are, we are losing the culture. And once you lose your culture, your root is gone. You lose, you've lost your root. So why don't they know how, don't they speak our language? Why do they have to speak? It's like a fancy thing, speaking English or hearing their children speak English. So this is what it is. I remember when we were going to school, you can't speak tree. We were, we were learning vernacular, but you can't speak it. Most of the time they say speak English, yeah. and which is wrong, which is wrong, which is wrong, which is wrong. Now mm -hmm. look at the Chinese are in our country and they are putting their children in school to learn African language. And our own children are not learning it. So you see what is wrong with that? Our children are going to grow up and they can't speak their own language in their own country. And the Chinese kid will be speaking our language. So who is going to be in charge? So these are some of the things that we have to enforce here, beg parents, because we are learning from the Chinese and the Indians that it's wrong that you don't let your children learn your culture. So we have to try. Now we have schools. Uh, when you, when uh, you go on the Ghana Union platform, we mm -hmm. have uh, posted uh, online schools for the children, our children to go on and learn how to speak Ghana languages. That's good. That's good. And also there's a homework club that is also helping the Ghanaian kids with their homework. So we've come far and then we are going far. Yeah. Exactly. I know that by the time I am praying that by the time I leave this earth, our culture, our heritage is passed on to our kids and their tradition. So I'm glad that um, the Ghanaian Canadian Association is, exists so that, you know, a lot of youth and a lot of different people can refer back to that and, and see how they can sustain their cultures and all of that. So I'm glad for, for that being uh, there for us. Um, what's one key lesson that you've learned in life so far? That one key lesson that I've learned mm -hmm. in life so far. In life so far? Mm -hmm. Maybe as a young woman I've... specifically, um, to other young women, what's one key lesson that you've learned? Uh, one key that I've learned is you have to learn to be humble. You have to learn to forgive. And then you have to also learn to give to others, to be there for each other. Mm -hmm. Not in a financial way as such, because uh, somebody will say that, or someone will say that, oh, but when somebody has funerals and all that, we go and all that. It's not, we are not going to the funeral just like that, because those who are putting on the funeral, they put it on all because they want to uh, recoup some of their expenses. So I know sometimes when you go to a funeral and you don't give anything, nobody will call you and say, thank you for coming. Because it's the monetary part that they usually, you know, those who go and give, they are the ones they will call to thank. But selflessness, be there for each other. And also, uh, as parents, you learn how to deal with your children at home because whatever you put out that is how they will grow up to be well most children 
they will listen to their mothers gossiping on the phone all day. They will listen to their fathers putting them down all day. And then they will say, you have to grow up to be a better person. But how do children grow up to be better people if all that you put in them is what they hear you or they see you do? Because you, the parents, are the Bible that your children read. So I, I'll say not the Bible, the book that they read. The Bible is the word of God and it's powerful and it's good. And uh, whatever you write in that book in their lives, that is why they will grow up to be. So if you are telling them they are no good, they are not going to grow up to be amount to anything, they are stupid, they are foolish, they are all that. And their mother sitting on the phone gossiping about the whole world, the whole, about everybody. And they leave the children to fend for themselves. And all these things affect your children as they are going up. So if they grow up and they couldn't amount to anything, it's not their fault, it's the parents' fault. So what I'll say is, be careful how you talk at home. Bring your children up the way you want them to be. As the Bible said, bring the children up in a way and they will not depart from it when they grow up. So if you bring them up in a, in a godly way, and you teach them good values and morals, they will not depart from it. But if they just listen to what you say and then turn around to tell them to do uh, do it the other way, it's not going to work. The youth, they are trying very well. They are trying very hard. But then deep within, they don't know how they grew up and how they feel. So this is what we have to uh, 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 teach our second generation. So wherever we are, uh, wherever we went wrong, they will not repeat it with their children so that we have a better generation to come. And, um, you know, thank you so much again. I know this has run longer than we initially planned for, but you had uh, so, so many uh, gems and, and uh, so much experience to discuss. So it's all good. Um, so Auntie, before I let you go, um, if anyone wants to connect with you online, where can they connect with you? Okay. I am on Facebook. Felicia Bocchio, I'm on Facebook. Mm -hmm. I am also on WhatsApp. Uh, the same name, Felicia Bocchio, with my, uh, you have my phone number. Do I have to put it out? Oh, no, you don't have to. <laughs> okay. I have my phone number. I'm on WhatsApp. I'm on Instagram. Auntie, what's and, your Instagram? Uh, <laughs> it's uh, a <laughs> it's uh, uh, be love be love yeah or felicia botry okay so anyone can yeah. just search uh felicia botry yeah. and find you felicia botry yes uh, okay. felicia botry. Botry. I, I, as i said i am all that but i don't go on all of i am whatsapp i'm on whatsapp more than a, 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 every one of them because of all the time on screen so sometimes i don't go on uh I go on Instagram once in a while, mm -hmm. and then uh, Facebook, I used to go on it a lot, but now I go on once in a while, but I'm always on WhatsApp. Okay. And then with the the seniors group, we are hoping that after COVID, and then since start, things start moving, we would like to uh, set up so many groups within the seniors, because there are a lot of seniors, we have a lot of experience to share. Yeah. There are seniors. I was married for 50 years before my husband passed on. Mm -hmm. There are lots of seniors who are married over 30 years. And they are still married. And there are a lot of uh, wisdom. A lot of business people. There are a lot of professional people. A lot of uh, skills with the seniors that we have retired with. So we would like to form groups. I'll have platforms that will be able to help our second generation very much so that they can also pass it on to the third, fourth generations that will come, the generations to come in our community. So we are willing and ready to do that. We want to open the door for our young 
to be able to come to us and learn from our experiences and uh, how to deal with every situation that they are in. That sounds amazing. And I think that's so, so well needed, you know, so that sounds really great. Um, And Auntie, thank you so much again for, you know, giving me your time to talk to me and, and be part of this podcast. I really appreciate it. You're very welcome, my dear. Anytime. Anytime. Yeah, anytime. Thank you so much for listening. Um, I hope you enjoyed the conversation. So I definitely did. And if you have any feedback, comments, reactions, use the hashtag AssassinBotPod and follow AssassinBot on Twitter and Instagram at AssassinBotPod. So also you can feel free to email AssassinBotPod at gmail.com as well. And this podcast is published every two weeks. So I will see you in two weeks. But yeah, I'll be on Instagram and Twitter as well. Uh, So yeah, share your reactions, share your feedback. You know, don't keep this to yourself. (laughs) So again, I will see you in two weeks time. Bye.